morning, everybody. Health and Human Services Committee is called to order Tuesday, April 4th. Today we have one bill on the agenda. Senator Wicklin to Senate File 2995. Thank you, Madam Chair. And let me get my papers organized a bit. Members, we have... Um, we have amendments that we need to take care of today, and we have some that um, members have to offer. Uh, I guess to start off, I'd like to move, I mean, everything that we're, all the amendments we're doing today are to the delete all A2 amendment. So I don't, I, do I need to move the A2 to have it before us? So, um, Madam Chair, I'd like to move the A2 amendment. And that's the delete everything that has been, I'll wait for council. Oh. Okay. So we will, uh, to the motion to adopt the A2 amendment. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. All those opposed, the amendment is adopted. Thank you, Madam Chair. And now I'd like to move to a couple of um, items that are um, more technical in nature. Um, first, I'd like to offer the A22 amendment and have um, Senate Council please walk through this amendment. And I believe that um, this one, it, it will uh, require all, all four of the Council to, <laughs> to talk about. Um, but I believe that Mr. Monahan's uh, language is at the beginning of this amendment. Mr. Monahan. Uh, Madam Chair, members, um, we've been asked to walk through the A22, um, really just highlighting um, the major changes in it, uh, skipping over most of the things that are purely technical. Um, so on the A22, uh, the first uh, thing I'll, I'll mention is page one, line 11. Um, it looks like we are deleting the continuous eligibility for children, but we are not. Uh, that language will appear elsewhere in the bill through a subsequent amendment. Uh, the next thing I want to point out is page one, line 13. It looks like we're deleting three sections, one of which, or the first of which is the pharmacy services benefit. That's actually not being deleted. It's being moved to a different um, portion of statute. You can see the language recreated on this same page at page one, line 17. The other two sections um, are related to the hospice, respite, and end-of-life benefit. Um, these are being deleted from Senator Wicklin's bill because they were inadvertently included. They are being carried in Senator Hoffman's bill. Um, the other substantive change begins at the bottom of page one, line 31. This is related to the recuperative care benefit. Uh, this is fixing some language that appears in uh, the A2 uh, related to extended stays. Uh, the rest of the language through the middle of the page um, to line 16 are all related to the pharmacy benefit uh, carve out from managed care. Uh, it is restricting the carve out to just MA, excluding Minnesota care, and uh, confining it to outpatient drugs. And finally, on page two, line 17, uh, it appears that we are uh, deleting from Minnesota care the pharmacy services benefit, but in fact, we're not because the MA statute covers Minnesota care, and it's included there. Thank you, Madam Chair. Members, I believe I'm up next. If you uh, turn to page two, line 29 of the A22 amendment, 
Uh, that language continues throughout page 3 and into page 4 until uh, line 4.9. Uh, it appears that a substantial amount of language is being added. However, that was technical assistance provided by the department. The reason that was added is um, to conform language in this section in order to avoid conflict with other changes that are being made with this section. Um, uh, Madam Chair and members, that takes us to page 4, line 17. Uh, and this carries us through page 15. There are several missing sections that inadvertently got dropped from the original delete everything, and these all relate to uh, the provisions for extending drug price, drug price transparency. Uh, and you can see this on the spreadsheet, line 975. These, and like I said, these sections were just inadvertently left off. Uh, Madam Chair, members, on line 15.23, through 16.7, we are moving the uh, grant to the Special Guerrilla Unit Veterans to Health rather than Human Services. On page 16, line 8, uh, section 42 on Mental Health and Substance Use Disorder Education Center is deleted, but it's moved to Article 5, so you'll see that later in the amendment. Uh, lines 11 through 15 make some adjustments to the long COVID provisions and then on 1616 you'll see a new section for fetal and infant death studies um, again this was inadvertently left out of the earlier amendment and it's carried on spreadsheet line 1448 and then going to page 19 line 33 section 51 is deleted this is the FQHC apprenticeship program uh, it is deleted from article 14 but it appears now in article 15 you'll see this later in the bill and again, at the top of page 20, uh, section 56, which is access to urgent need insulin, is deleted, and that's moved to Article 6, so you'll see that later in the amendment. And then there are some additional sections to implement the public health system transformation language that's carried on the spreadsheet, line 1384. On the bottom of page 21, section 57 is deleted. That's the Mental Health Professional Scholarship Grant. And that is moved to Article 5. So you'll see that later in the amendment. And then if you turn to page 22, 23 and 24, you'll see the sections that have been deleted from Article 4 and now appear in Article 5. On page 26, there are provisions starting on 26.12, uh, adding our, several sections to Article 6 to pick up the rest of the fee adjustments from the governor's recs that were not included in the original DE. Uh, and then on 27.14, you'll see the access to urgent need insulin um, moved from Article 4. It now appears here in Article 6. Starting on line 28.31 um, through 29.28, these were two sections that were inadvertently omitted in the original DE that pertain to the uh, Certified Community Behavioral Health Clinic licensing provisions. Um, on page 30.17 through 30.27, these are also correcting a couple drafting errors. Um, two proposals were omitted by mistake in the DE that are carried on the spreadsheet. Uh, removing the tribal per capita income is being counted and then adding in a, a conforming change to the Minnesota Family Investment Program uh, six-month <coughs> eligibility. And then on page 31, line 12, you can see that the uh, uh, Special Guerrilla Units Veterans Grant is being deleted, and that was moved to health, as I mentioned earlier. And then finally, uh, turning to line 31.14, this language actually carries through until the end of the amendment. Um, and that is because it is the language from Senator Wicklund's Senate File 49, which has been moved to be a singular article at the end of this bill. It is the same language that this committee heard on Thursday. However, certain cross-references has been have been updated as a result of it moving from a standalone bill with multiple articles into a single article in this budget bill. 
There is one additional change to the language of Senate File 49 as um, moved into this bill that I would point out to members as being different from the language heard on Thursday, specifically on line 41.8. Uh, a statement has been changed that the board may impose a civil penalty as a last resort and that it's part of the health care affordability board section. That language has been changed to a statement that the board may impose a civil penalty if the board determines the health care entity is unlikely to voluntarily comply with all applicable requirements of this subdivision. Thank you. Thank you, Council. Uh, members, any questions about the A22? Hmm? Uh, Senator Abler. Which one should I use? Um, I'm going to miss that last resort language. That was kind of like just tragic. It was some of the finest, I don't know, just the coolest language you've ever seen. But um, So I do have a question as I followed most of that anyway. Uh, and on the MA carve out um, for the drug thing and is Minnesota Care carved out, or was it? Is it just? Can you explain that again, Mr. Ryan? Uh, Madam Chair, Senator Abler, uh, the carve out only applies to uh, medical assistance for outpatient uh, drugs. Okay, and Madam Chair is. Sorry, is, is there a reason for that? Is it just not workable otherwise? Or, you know, I, so I mean, that seems like that's a significant change, but um, does anybody know that? Senator Wicklin? Um, Madam Chair, Senator Abler, uh, this language, I, I need to go back and revisit how this, because I, I have to say I, I didn't hear from I mean, I, I don't know exactly where you took this from. Is this from the House language in the, or the language that the House included? Mr. Monahan. Madam Chair, Senator Wicklin, um, my understanding is that you had a conversation with Matt Burdick about this language, okay. and I confirmed that conversation with him. Okay. Uh, last evening, yeah. I can see him back there. And and, he can, <laughs> <laughs> and I believe you. Yes. We had numbers, a number of conversations about many different provisions. But if Matt would like to, or if you'd like to, Madam Chair, that would be helpful. Thank you. Oh. Go ahead. Um, Madam Chair, Senator. The MA carve out applies to MA only and not Minnesota Care because of the different financing structures of the two programs. Medical assistance has the federal Medicaid drug rebate. Minnesota Care is much more like a commercial plan, so carving out the MA portion aligns that with what fee for service is currently doing the majority of the processing on. Thank you, Madam Senator Chair. Abler. Just one other one. Um, and so that's, you used the word rebate, and so probably you don't know the answer now, but I'm curious. Uh, what does happen to the rebates and are those captured in a fund somewhere? And so if you don't know now, you can just take it offline, but that's an ongoing question I have. Madam Chair, Senator, I'm sorry for the record. My name is Chad Hope, Pharmacy Director for DHS. The federal rebates are collected by DHS, shared with the federal government as required by the federal law, and then they're used to pay down the cost of administering the program. So they're 100% applied towards the cost of the program. All right, just one Senator last, so, so um, Mr. Hope, so they're baked into the forecast already uh, as a presumed income that's kind of, in, in this, in the fiscal note, they'd be baked in already, is that right? Madam Chair, Senator, that I don't know. I'm not okay. familiar enough with that. I will forecast. talk, take it offline, thank you. Senator Eckie. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, and be, uh, before you scoot, I got a question for you. Um, Along that same line of questioning, a question that I've had the last few days is, and if you could furnish that at some point, you probably won't have it handy, but what is that amount um, that would be captured with this carve-out um, that would be going back to the department? So, Madam Chair, Senator, um, the federal Medicaid drug rebate applies to both managed care claims and fee-for-service, so we are currently capturing that amount. Uh, annually, I believe it comes out to roughly $800 million. Good. Thank you. 
questions? Other questions? On the motion to adopt the A222 amendment, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? The amendment is adopted. <clears throat> Senator Wicklund. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And um, I apologize, I don't have notes about every all of the details on these things. And we had many conversations over the weekend. So um, next, I would like to offer the A28 amendment. And you should have that already. That is the um, amendment that contains the rider information. And this amendment uh, matches what is on the spreadsheet that you received this morning. Members, you have the A28 in your packets, the appropriations. Any questions? Senator Abler. Well, thanks. Just a comment, Madam Chair and Senator Wickland. I've sat in that chair. Uh, it's, it's an amazing juggling act that you have to go through to keep track of this. And if, you know, it's, I don't expect you to know every detail. And we rely on our staff. And I just wanted to use this as a chance to thank our staff. Uh, we've got some incredible counsel uh, and fiscal people. And uh, the committee staff has been uh, nothing short of remarkable. And the departments have put a lot of time on this. We don't always agree on the content. But I, we do agree that we are really blessed with that kind of staff. So. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay. Thank you, Senator. On the motion to adopt the A28, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? The A28 is adopted. Um, oh. Senator. Uh, sorry, Madam Chair. I uh, was planning to go forward with a couple other amendments that I have that are uh, more things that have been discussed and um, I'd like to get through. Um, first, I guess I'd like to offer the, the A11 amendment, and I believe that the eight, council will pass that one out. Being passed out, you um, want to describe it? Sure. Uh, and no particular reason that I didn't have it distributed other than I thought for keeping track of the papers today that I would have her hand out some of these, um, have council hand them out. Um, so the A11 amendment has to do with the 988 crisis um, system, and thank you. And I had received um, in feedback from the telecommunications com entities that they would um, like to see some additional language added to bring this in more in line with the way we handle 911 fees and some of the other telecommunication fees. So uh, the, the amendment starting on 1.5 and insert some language that would require uh, the commissioner prepare some reporting um, to help us understand how much um, is being collected, uh, the, the balance, and several you know other details like that. And then there is a waiver process. And these two paragraphs are um, very similar to what is in place for the 911 fee. Um, the other changes, the first two, um, let's see, lines 1.3 and 1.4, have to do with also aligning with the 911 fees. Um, currently, that fee and another telecommunication telecommunications fees, they don't have a floor for the, the fee. They have a cap only. And so to bring this um, this proposed change into alignment with those fees, um, I've just removed the, the lower cap. And the uh, commissioner, um, the governor's budget sets a proposed fee um, of 12 cents, and that doesn't change, that isn't changing with this amendment at all. Any conversation on the A11? Senator Rucky. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Senator Wicklund, a question um, which will help. I've got some stuff on this topic a little later. But the uh, question I have, because this is talking about the budget, do we, is there a targeted budget um, to start this program? It's, it's got to be some sort of a number that they're shooting for. Senator Wicklund. Madam, uh, Madam Chair, Senator Utke, yes, there's, uh, there's an initial uh, appropriation because the fee won't be taking effect right away. Um, and that's to help get the, um, to fund the, the crisis or the 988 system. But then when the telecommunications fee is in place, then that would provide the funding for it. And that is in the 
um, on the spreadsheet, I believe, listed out as appropriations, and then the fee is listed out as well. Senator Rocky. I don't know thank, if thank Mr. You, Albrecht Chair. can point out um, which lines that is, if you'd like. Um, I believe the number in the spreadsheet is $4 million. Do you, from what you understand, do you think that's a yearly cost, or is, at least that's what they're planning on? Uh, Madam Chair, I think that the, the governor's budget and the, the advocates, that's what they've proposed as what they need to um, to get the system um, stabilized. I mean, it's currently in place, but they um, are receiving some federal funding that's going to go away. And so the proposed funding is to maintain the service and, and make sure that it can function and handle the the um, increased volume of calls and texts that have been um, received so far. Thank you. Senator Abler. Well, thanks. And uh, I just uh, realized as I was handed this amendment by a page, I forgot to mention the pages without which uh, we wouldn't be able to function very well. So, uh, And then the caucus staff, too. And by the way, there's, I brought some strawberries in this morning there in the back thing, which is kind of a healthy way to deal with some of the challenges of sitting here in a tight place. And, I think the amendment is a great amendment, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Um, on the motion to adopt the A11, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? The aye. amendment is adopted. Senator Wicklin. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like to offer the amendment that relates to the Department of Children, Youth, and Families, and I'm not sure that I, I think I have a paper that has the number, but I don't. It's the A18 members, and that is in your packets. Senator, to the A18. Uh, Madam Chair, the A18 amendment is the result of uh, collecting the amendments that were made as that bill uh, to establish the Department of Children, Youth, and Families traveled to three other committees. It went to Education Finance, um, State and Local Government, and the Judiciary Committee. Uh, the method we used to do that was to use clones that were introduced clone bills um, that were introduced, and so those changes that we made in those other committees didn't get uh, reflected in the, the bill language that um, we first um, put into the delete everything. And so this amendment takes all of those changes and would um, amend the, the delete everything so that we incorporate them. Thank you, Senator. Discussion on the A18? Senator Abler? Well, thank you, and actually you saved me asking a question later, so I appreciate the addition of line 120 with the data practices. This was worked on, I know, with quite a bit of depth by Mr. Neumeister and uh, Representative um, Scott and others. Is this the language, is this the latest version that they've come up with that I saw a week or two ago? Senator Wicklin. Uh, Madam Chair, Senator Abler, yes, this is the version that we, um, we had introduced and applied to the bill when it was in the Judiciary Committee. All right, Ms. Madam. Senator Chair. Abler. Well, thank you for that. Um, and I, I think that people are much more comfortable with that, so i really think, glad to see that. And then I have a question on line 1.4. Um, and about the bargaining part, I totally understand bargaining. Uh, is If I paraphrase this, it doesn't create a new bargaining, right? It just says if the... Um, if this change affects the current bargained agreement, then those changes to that bargained agreement have to be bargained. Is that right? Senator Wicklin. Um, I, I'm sorry, I don't have the amendment in front of me, but yes, I believe that's the case. It was to give um, assurances about moving to the new department and how it might affect or not affect, you know, current contracts. Right. So Senator Ebler. Well, I just, I'm, I'm on the Education Committee as well. I just, and this came up and the, the Senate took a slightly gentler approach to some of these changes about um, what could be bargained or what has to be bargained compared to running the school. So it, it, as I read it, it's, it, I mean, it, whatever, we can talk about it later, but I, it seems like it, it's reasonable that if it affects the agreement that's been bargained that that change should be also discussed with the people. But it doesn't create any new bargaining rights. Is that right? Yes. Thank you very much. Other discussion? Perfect. 
Seeing none, on the motion to adopt the A18, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, the amendment is adopted. Senator Wickman. Uh, let's see, I think. Then I have an amendment that's in your packets, the A19 amendment. And this was one that um, I'm offering on, on behalf of Senator Dibble, who would has worked with um, some advocates about the, the long COVID language that's in the bill. And uh, advocates wish to have more definition. And I'm just going to let me look for my notes on this one. Uh, A19, it adds clarifying language to the definition of long COVID. Um, the language as written in the bill requires the Commissioner of Health to establish a program to conduct community assessments and epidemi epidemiologic investigations to monitor and address impacts of long COVID. However, long COVID is a complex illness and overlaps with other conditions um, such as myalgic encephalomyelitis, chronic fatigue, Fatigue syndrome, syndrome and dysautonomia. Hmm. I'm not sure if I'm saying that right. And postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, which is um, acronym of POTS. So what this amendment does is include related conditions as conditions to incorporate for the new long COVID program to include in their community assessments and investigations. And I did receive information that um, one of the uh, the listed conditions is not necessary, and um, they requested that I make an oral amendment to strike post-external malaise from the amendment. And if council can tell tell us how to do that. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and members. On the A19 amendment, it would be on page 1, line 12, delete the first comma and insert the word and, and strike the second comma and post external malaise and insert a period, and then delete page 1, line 13. Members, questions about the oral amendment to the amendment? Questions or conversation about the A19 as amended, uh, Senator Wicklund? Okay, do we, um, Madam Chair, I'm just asking, do we need to vote on the oral amendment or will we just incorporate it? Okay, that will be incorporated. Thank you. Uh, we can go ahead and vote on the oral amendment. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? The oral amendment to the amendment is adopted. Uh, any discussion to the amendment as amended? Seeing none, all those in favor of the A19 as amended signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed? The A19 as amended is adopted. Senator Wicklund. Madam Chair, I think that is all that I have right now. Um, we can go to other, me other members' amendments or questions. Members, amendments or discussion? Senator Morrison. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like to offer the A40 amendment. Members, the A40 will be handed out. Do you want to talk about it while it's being handed out, Senator? I'd be delighted, Madam Chair. Uh, the A40 is a very simple amendment. It just adds to um, the Pulsed Board um, Advisory Committee. It uh, just adds uh, registered nurses as um, participants on that advisory council. Members, discussions about the A40. Madam Chair. Senator Wicklund. Uh, uh, Madam Chair, Senator Morrison brought this to me. I think this is a, a good addition to that advisory committee that would be formed. So I would say it's a, a friendly amendment. Okay. Uh, Senator Abler. In that case, all those in favor of the A40 signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, the A40 is adopted. Senator Morrison. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Did you want me to continue with my amendments? Please. Okay, then. <laughs> uh, let's see. I would like to offer the A23 amendment. Members, the A23 is in your packet. Senator, go ahead. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, the A23 relates to um, coverage of uh, rare disease. Uh, and it, uh, it just kind of it clarifies what is covered and what is not. And I might ask council to um, just walk us through the details of the amendment, if that's OK. Council. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Um, as the amendment author noted, it covers services for the diagnosis, monitoring, and treatment of rare diseases. Uh, it does this in both the commercial market as well as in the MA market. Uh, for I would point out that what is covered in the MA market is slightly different from what's covered in the commercial market, and I can give the rationale behind that. So MA says medical assistance coverage for services um, related to the diagnosis, monitoring, and treatment of rare disease or conditions, which that's defined elsewhere in this um, amendment, must meet the requirements in section 22Q.451. But then it goes on to say in paragraph B, which starts on line 1.9, nothing in this subdivision requires a managed care or county-based purchasing plan to provide coverage for a service that is not covered under medical assistance. That's a medical assistance piece. And then if you turn to, let's see, the commercial piece, you'll see slightly different language. Uh, so on line 4.1, it says nothing in this section requires a health plan company to provide coverage for a medication procedure or treatment or laboratory or clinical testing that is not covered under the enrollee's health plan. That is intended to be slightly narrower um, with the rationale that in the commercial market, more negotiations can take place. Uh, there are provisions that relate to in-network providers as well as out-of-network providers and what they can be compensated for such services and um, limitations on cost sharing and deductibles as well. Thanks. Thank you, Senator Wicklin. Um, Madam Chair, I've discussed this with Senator Morrison. Um, I think that we have um, we've talked about this coverage and how um, challenging it is for people who are seeking um, diagnosis of a rare disease and how how long it can take and trying to find ways to make it more um, efficient for patients to move through that process uh, by um, having access to the right providers at the right time. So I, I think this is... Uh, reasonable to add, I think that we'll need to continue to look at the language and um, and just see um, there are some concerns about how we carve out different um, different types of insurance or make limitations, but I'm happy to work with um, Senator Morrison as we go through this process on this bill or on this provision. Senator's discussion on the A23. Senator Aki. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. And um, to start off with, I mean, covering the rare diseases is a good deal. We need to, to find a way to do that. But my questions are going to be related to the way this is proposed at this point, and hopefully, as Senator Wickland has talked about, the conversations can continue um, with the advocates on all ends of this, um, from those that are um, wanting to see this additional coverage to the health plans who would be uh, mandated. And um, as we look at the bill that's before us, there's a lot of mandates in there that are going to drive up the cost of health care or the cost of our health insurance um, going forward. Um, but a couple of the questions related to this, and I'm taking them out of the uh, mandate review because this was uh, uh, completed by the Department of Commerce, there are only 
three rare diseases that they reviewed and priced. Um, when I understand there are up to possibly 7,000 or whatever, there's a lot of possible rare diseases out there. Uh, any, anybody know why it was just restricted to those? Um, um, because it's definitely going to affect our numbers. Um, Senator Wicklin or anyone from the department out there? I, uh, unless Senator Morrison has information, I, I do not. But. Senator? Um, Madam Chair, Senator Wicklin, Senator Aki, um, I, I assume that it would be a fairly laborious process to review more than, you know, many thousands of diseases. Um, so I, I assume a sampling was taken, but maybe there's someone from the department who could answer that for us. Or I'm not sure if the Department of Commerce I is see here. someone coming. But while we're waiting, Madam Chair, I would add that the intent of the bill and the amendment um, is to ensure that, that the rare disease community receives the treatment that it needs. You know, we talk about the diagnostic journey that a patient goes through. So it can last as long as eight years to figure out what the condition is, and then once that diagnosis is landed on, finding the specialist uh, who, who is expert in caring for that person uh, is another kind of part of this journey. So ensuring that people have access to the care that they need is critical. And with that, I will now defer to you, ma'am. <laughs> Ms. Bassett. Well, good morning. Um, Madam Chair and Madam Chair uh, and members. Um, so, Helen Bassett from the Department of Commerce, and so what I can say in limited comments is that the process for a mandated review is one that's actually um, asked for by the chair of the committee. And so we don't just willy-nilly, the Commerce Department doesn't just develop those reports. So there needs, needs to be a request from um, the chair uh, working with his colleagues to actually determine what is going to be studied. The department has been working on a process um, to help the chairs understand better kind of how that works, but the department doesn't independently establish mandate reports. Senator Aki. Thank or you, or the Chair. content of, of them. You know, it's related to what's asked for. Thank you. Um, and I guess all I want to point out here is the fact that, yeah. that there's a lot more to the rare diseases than what we've seen in the report. And uh, part of that, uh, I've heard that uh, term it, ensuring access for those that uh, are needing the services. And um, that is great. But as I read this uh, uh, amendment, CGIP is carved out. Why would that be? Senator Morrison or Senator Wicklin? Uh, Madam Chair and Senator Utke, um, we're still working on this amendment and it's carved out uh, for now while we figure out um, how to square the, the finances of the bill. We hope to be able to add it back in. Senator Utke. Thank you, Madam Chair. And yeah, it, from the mandate review, it shows that it's $4.226 million dollars um, a year starting in year 25 because that was the first full year. So it is a sizable amount and that same thing goes into um, the, the private sector costs which I believe um, the insurance premium for a family of four um, up in uh, northern area of Minnesota could be a, a, in the neighborhood of 250 to $300 a pro per month. Um, so we're going to see increases, and that's all I want to point out here is we know it's important, but we've got to work with all the parties involved to figure out how to do this and not break the bank because I see this along, like I mentioned earlier, along with the other mandates getting to the point where we price health insurance out of the market for people again. Um, we've lived through that a number of years ago, but um, I think with that, I, it's the mandate review was... Uh, good. It, it, it pointed out a lot of these things, and I hope that going forward you can find some way to, to make this work and uh, um, be respectful of everybody's pocketbooks. So thank you. Thank you, Senator Rocky. And I think that 
brings us to a bigger conversation about why health insurance is so expensive in the first place but doesn't cover so many things, right? Uh, other discussion about the A23. Senator Abler. Well, thank you, and I do appreciate the discussion. And so, as I'm, and I support, you know, treating rare diseases, and um, it's, it's really interesting. People think they have insurance, and they have it, but they can't find somebody who will fix what they are trying to address. And so, Senator Morrison, is this really just any willing provider for rare diseases, which I like Senator, that idea. Is Senator that basically Morrison. if I oversimplify it? Uh, Madam Chair, Senator Abler, will you repeat your question? Sorry, I didn't hear part of it. Oh, is, it, uh, is this really like any willing provider for rare diseases? If you're familiar uh, it, with that term, any willing provider is where you don't have a limited network, but you can choose the provider of your choice. Senator? Madam Chair, Senator Abler, the idea with this amendment is that families who are on that diagnostic odyssey, and then once they get a diagnosis, finding a provider who is skilled in treating that disease is hugely challenging, and families go bankrupt in this process. Um, and so this amendment uh, makes it clear that uh, patients, well, I, I let counsel describe it probably better than I will, but it provides a framework for patient, for payments to out-of-network providers. Right, yeah. So the patients can find a provider who's expert in their rare disease. Right. Senator Abler. Madam Chair, well, it's not a pejorative what I was asking. It's, the answer is kind of like, yes, and I favor that, uh, frankly. And um, I'm, you haven't heard my uh, rhetoric for many years talking about why we restrict networks to people who are otherwise qualified, who are willing to follow the terms of the contract that they can't get into, that may live next door to the person who they want to serve, and they have to travel miles or whatever, and that the savings that comes, in my opinion, is largely due to people receiving inadequate amounts of care because they can't get to somewhere. So. So I appreciate that, um, and so I, you know, is it going to cost the money? I suppose, but it, but that's it's costing money because uh, because the carrier was saving money on not giving people what they thought they had. Uh, Senator Morrison, just look, going forward, there might be a change you want to introduce. Uh, I'm not going to make the motion now, but on line 312, I think what you mean um, that talks about unrestricted access, which uh, I think is a good idea um, and actually avoid bigger costs by getting people the coverage they want early. Uh, but on line 3.112, it uh, says including but not limited to restrictions through prior authorization. I think you might want to insert the word additional on line 3.112 in front of restrictions. And we, I can talk to you about it, but I think that's what you really mean. And if you want to change it now, you could. But I just think that's because there, there would be restrictions because it says earlier that they have to kind of follow the plan of the other contracted providers. And in fact, something, if it's not covered, still isn't covered. So that, that's just, you can re react if you want or just talk about it later. Senator? Uh, uh, Madam Chair and, and Senator Abler, I appreciate your careful reading of the amendment. The way I read it, I think it says the same thing, but I, I'm open to adding additional. I don't know if council wants to weigh in if that, yeah. I'm reading it as restrictions that apply through prior authorization, pre-authorization, which could also mean, yeah. I, I guess I read it, that it's clear the way it is. Perhaps you could help my counsel. <laughs> Madam Chair, Senator Morrison, uh, I, I tend to agree. I think there's no harm in adding the word additional. Um, that being said, I, I tend to agree that it, um, as drafted, covers the intent of Senator right. Abler and Senator Morrison. Well, Madam Chair, then if you don't mind, I'll move that amendment just to add the word additional. It's friendly to what you're trying to do, I think. So, thanks. Yeah, to, so the, the motion would be on line with 3.112 after the two to add a, additional, the word additional. Senator Morrison. Madam Chair, Senator Abler, I prefer economy of uh, language, but I will defer to you and we can add the word additional. Thank you. On the motion to the oral amendment to the amendment, any questions? All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? The oral amendment to the amendment is adopted. Further discussion on the amendment as amended? Seeing none, all those in favor of adopting the A23 as amended, signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? The A23 as amended is adopted. 
<coughs> Senator Morrison, did you want to keep going or did you want to? Madam Chair, we can take a break. If okay. Other discussion or amendments? Madam Chair. Senator Wigman. I, I do have one more that I would like to offer okay. uh, before we keep going. Um, this is the 826. And, um, the 826 will be handed out. Do you want to describe it while it's being handed out? Um, thank you, Madam Chair. This is um, a, a request from one of the, the school, um, school health uh, organizations uh, just to clarify that the school-based health centers, um, the work that they do is not replacing um, the daily support that's provided in the school by educational student service providers including but not limited to licensed school nurses, educational psychologists, school so social workers, and school counselors. It's just a meant um, uh, to clarify that these school-based health centers are not um, supplanting or taking over duty or responsibilities that are currently served by school personnel. Thank you. Discussion on the A26. Seeing none, all those in favor of adopting the A26 signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed? The amendment is adopted. Senator Liskey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, I'd like to move the A10 amendment. A10 amendment is not in your packet, members. It will be handed out. Senator Liskey, go ahead and describe it. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, the amendment is to discuss the ongoing efforts of the optometry group. Uh, they're trying to work on their scope of practice. Uh, this is to bring it up. They've been working on it since 2014. Uh, <clears throat> it is a copy of Senator McQuaid's Senate file 1761, which did not receive a hearing uh, this year. Uh, the issues and the reason I'm bringing it forward is that people both in urban areas and in rural Minnesota are having issues <laughs> with getting access to proper care post-surgical, post things of that nature. And so this would be a scope bill um, trying to help with coverage of care. Uh, the purpose of this bill is really just to kind of have the discussion. Uh, I don't plan on forcing a vote on this one, but I do plan on having the discussion here. So uh, I'd really like to see improvement on the optometry board uh, to allow them to kind of properly manage their scope and, and help with uh, the same things across the state of Minnesota. The issue is that this has been accepted by many other states. We are one of the last states to accept most of this stuff. So that's why I brought it forward. Senator Wicklin. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, thank you, Senator Liskey, for bringing this forward. And I appreciate having the discussion ahead of time, um, ahead of committee today. Uh, I do uh, feel that we have um, several proposals brought forward to us by different board or different uh, Healthcare professions, and we were not able to fit time in to have a good examination and hearings on on these proposals this year. I feel that we did um, accommodate many many budget bills or budget related bills, and and I would um, assure Senator Liskey that we will take act or take up these bills next year or next session. And I'm happy to have a discussion. Um, you know, during the interim about that process. Um, and I would like to have a hearing on this bill um, because it does um, change the powers of the board, which I, I would like to hear a lot more from the boards about <clears throat> their ability to do this and what their reaction would be to the language. So I, I do think it, it um, requires a, a full hearing and a chance for all of the advocates to be able to weigh in. So I, I appreciate that um, if we can do that next session. Senator Lusky. Thank you, Madam Chair. And it sounds like we have uh, agreement that this does need to be handled and it will be addressed uh, here in the upcoming session uh, next year. So with that, I'll withdraw the amendment. The A-10 has been withdrawn. Senator Lusky. Senator Abler. Thank you. I've got uh, two little projects here. Uh, Madam Chair, I'll move the A25 amendment, which is not in your packets. A25 not because of any be secret, out. just didn't get around to it. So. You can go ahead and talk about it. Absolutely. Um, and so uh, there's an issue with licensed traditional midwives and their ability to, to purchase drugs. 
um, they can dispense them, and except for one, one provider is not letting them buy them. Uh, that are no one argues that they're able to uh, make use of them. Well, actually, I, I, I just moved the wrong one. I mean to move the uh, the other one. So actually, I'm sure I'll withdraw the A25 and move the A6. And I apologize for making the pages work twice as hard. Um, so it's, it's my intention to discuss the A6, and then we're going to actually act on the A25. But the, the A6 talks about, um, on line 1.8, it talks about that a licensed midwife, the losses they administer, vitamin K, either orally and maternal, rogam, postpartum, anti-hemorrhage, regix drugs, et cetera, um, uh, as, a, as appropriate. And there's no argument that they're qualified to, to do that. And many of them were actually buying these somewhere, and then one uh, purveyor said, well, oh, it doesn't say you can buy them. And so they, wouldn't, they can't get them, which is odd. And so it's, it's just an oversight in the drafting originally. And so it would be my desire, if we could, to approve that they could purchase, possess, and administer. Uh, apparently that's uh, deemed, uh, I don't know, it's... I wish we didn't have to listen to what the House wants to do, but um, over there they say this is a scope issue, and I see it as a clarification issue, but it's an issue. And so uh, to improve our birth outcomes, we want to use midwives more, and everybody agrees to that, to where it's appropriate. So anyway, so um, that's the issue, um, but rather than, you know, have something that's not going to work, um, Madam Chair, I'll withdraw the A6 and then offer the A25, uh, which asks the uh, Board of Medical Practice to make a ruling, which I, not to say what they, um, well, this just says what they rule on it and get the issue resolved as an interpretation, which is well within their, their scope, compared to the optometry amendment, which would give them more authority, the optometry board more authority. This is well within the Board of Medical Practices scope to just clarify what the intent was. And so uh, I'll, that's my request. And there was a testifier if you want one, but I'm, Happy to stand for questions. Thank you, Senator. So the A6 has been withdrawn, and we're looking at the A25 members. Senator Wicklund. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Madam Chair, Senator Abler, I, I have had discussions with a few different people about this, and I, I appreciate your willingness to bring forward an amendment to have, um, to have the board to recommend that they look at it. Um, come back with um, some findings, and then if if it requires us to make this change in the, the scope of practice, that we could hear the recommendations and then take that action next session. So I appreciate being able to do this in a more methodical way. I understand that it is, it could be a, a matter of um, more urgency to them, and I don't um, want to downplay that, but I do appreciate going through a little bit more of a process on this. So. Further discussion or questions on the A25? Okay. Seeing none, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed? The amendment. Thank you, Madam Chair. And is adopted. I have one more. Senator Ibler. It's okay. I'd like to move the A30, which I don't know if that's been passed out either. Um, the A30 is not in the packet, Senator Abel. You can go ahead and discuss it while it's being absolutely. Out. And uh, Madam Chair, uh, we discussed the challenges with access, and maybe Mr. Hope can come up. He offered to talk about this, um, and so um, the uh, Access Clinic, uh, which is a, uh, a clinic that serves some very uh, high, um, you know, uh, challenging. Uh, uh, clients, I believe 83 percent of the of the clientele prefer a language other than English. Uh, there's uh, they're in the heart of wherever you want wherever we want all the the people to be serving. The, the the Department of Health article has like a plethora of of projects to serve the very people that Access Clinic is serving. Uh, I don't remember the fellow's name, uh, but there was a, a cool guy who was 60 something who had really high blood pressure. And he went to get his prescription filled, and it was complicated that the clinic didn't take the right card or something. And, and um, so he just didn't get his prescription. And uh, for his medication, he was like 200 something over whatever for his blood pressure. And he wound up dying. And so that seems like an outcome that we 
and he was just, they, they just know, he was just this coolest guy, and he would brighten the room and he'd walk in, and, and so, um, so I don't know the right way to fix this, but it, it seems like that's not what we're trying to accomplish. Um, and, and so places like Axis and others uh, just need help to get this sorted out. And if this is the right answer, perhaps, but I'd like Mr. Hope to comment on discussions. I raised this, this issue a couple weeks ago, and there have been a few conversations, and I'm at least hoping the conversation can go forward. Because it's our intent that these FQHCs and FQHC lookalikes are in the heart of districts that we all want to serve in the name of good medicine and equity and, and people living to enjoy Minnesota. So with that, Ms. Madam Chair, I would see if Mr. Hope could comment on the status of what they're going to try to help Access and others do. I was looking back there. Go ahead. <laughs> Madam Chair, Senator, for the record, my name is Chad Hope, Pharmacy Director at DHS. Um, some of this is going to be a little outside of my scope because it deals with FQHC reimbursement. If that happens, uh, you know, someone please correct me here. Um, it's my understanding that access as an FQHC lookalike could open a pharmacy today and utilize 340B. Uh, we've had one conversation with access, and it's not clear from the language here what the intent is, but from the conversation, as I understood it, the intent was to utilize 340B and generate revenue from the 340B in the, either the FQHC or pharmacy program. And that's the issue, not whether or not they could open a pharmacy or utilize 340B. If pharmacy was in their scope as an FQHC, the cost of operating that pharmacy would go into the calculation of what's called their encounter rate. So essentially the cost would be captured and divided by the encounters and they would be called, paid a cost-based rate to cover their cost. That's today. That could happen today. Um, if they were able to open a pharmacy not included in their scope and then bill those claims to fee-for-service as an outpatient pharmacy claim, whether or not that's allowed in the FQHC look-like rules, that I don't know, having one in or out of scope and using 340B because that comes under the HRSA, not DHS rules. But then that would cross over to what's called the covered outpatient drug rule. CMS requires state Medicaid agencies to pay no more than actual acquisition cost, even for 340B drugs. So in either mechanism, they could potentially be paid for the drugs if that second option is allowable under the HRSA rules. But what could not occur without us jeopardizing our federal funding for the program would be to pay more than the acquisition cost or more than the cost base rate for those if it's included in the scope. Madam Chair. Senator. That was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and so I don't intend to litigate the 340B program today here, um, and I'm learning more about it. I don't admit to being deeply knowledgeable, but I, my, my intention here, our programs actually have to work to serve the people who need them. And we are caught in a bureaucratic, if you, that, that's something that a master's level paper could dissect. It was, you said it very well, Mr. Hope. Um, but if you comprehended all that, that would be, really a, a good in-depth study. We have made this system so complicated that this guy had to die. And that's the bottom. I wish I remembered his name. It started with a B, and maybe I don't get to know his name anyway because it's just as well, but it's, he's protected. But um, it has to work. And the programs that the Department of Health is bringing forward actually have to work, and they need to be coordinated. And so we have a great program of QHCs, we have a program of this little clinic, we got Indian Health Boards, we, and, and so we have to have more programs. And in this bill we're bringing more programs, and I'm going to offer a little comment on all those, except that they have to work. And the departments have to work together, Department of Health and Department of Human Services have to work together to make sure that people like this don't die in the name of spending all the money and all the effort and all the good intention and all the focus that we've got on reaching out to people who are underserved and disserved and for whatever reason. And so this is my effort to continue the dialogue. Um, Mr. Hope, you're reading the language, hoping to get some clue about what to do. This was an effort to make sure that you 
and on behalf of the department and the Department of Health where they weigh in and whoever else has to weigh in to make sure that no more guys die like this. Because if the, the person is too, it's too complicated, like they go to a clinic, they, they go to a pharmacy with their card and discovering that there's not a contract with that clinic for their card. Like, what? And, and so then they barely speak English to start with, and so they got a ride to go to the place, and then there's a copay that's bigger than they can afford, or it's just complicated, and then where do they go next? They don't even know where to go next. And so it's, it's just not working, and I think the passion of this, of this committee and of this whole room is that it works. And so will you please continue to go back and work with those folks, but on a grander scale, commissioners, both of you are listening, I'm sure, to the department staff, I'm sure you're listening. It's got to work. And as we think about adding in a dozen new programs to the Department of Health and DHS, can we make sure that the ones we have work and that the ones we're going to add actually dovetail in the, to the proper audiences? I had a great conversation with the Commissioner uh, Cunningham yesterday on this very topic, and so that's why which could have been a two-hour discussion about all, these, about all these bills, is this short comment that it has to work. And I am committed to working to accomplish the intentions of those proposals. But we don't want to wind up with a program like this that is unable to serve the very man who needed it. So, Madam Chair, with that, I'll withdraw the amendment. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. And I agree with you. Um, if only there was a simpler health care system out yeah. there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So, so simple that the rest of the world adopted some form of it or another. <laughs> but, <laughs> Senator Hoffman. I, 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 Madam Chair, I, I, I like where this conversation is going. And Senator Abler, you, you hit a point when you said health and human services, interagency, in, integrating services. And, and Dr., well, he's gone now. The, the intent of HRSA, Health Resources Service Administration, is to absolutely get across that sectional, cross-sectional uh, piece that states should be doing. And so I would be interested, Madam Chair, and really, if these are issues that should be addressed in our report as a state to the Health Resources Service Administration, I'd like to know what our department's doing in order to achieve that integrated, comprehensive, coordinated support within that within that framework and that gets to the whole piece so don't let this amendment just separate set aside I think this is something of value and importance that we should be addressing in both our committees that we all serve on so uh, just to that point thank you for bringing that up and I look forward to reading the title five health uh, resource service administration <laughs> report that the state put out Senator Abler. Senator Abler, do you have any other amendments you wanted to bring forward no, Madam Chair, but I do appreciate your uh, your comment, and that was. Uh, I, but I don't think it's. I don't think there's any simple answer. I don't think there's a magic plan. Um, we're studying Senator Marty's project in this bill. But I, I, we have to actually be able to look at what we're doing in any context and see what really is the best. And it's. Uh, and I appreciate the discussion and ongoing. Madam Chair, I have no more amendments. Thank you. Senator Utke, did you have any amendments? Maybe a few. Um, and in no particular order, I'll start them off. Uh, let's start with the A32. A32 is not in your packet, members. It will be handed out. Senator Rucky, you can talk about it while it's being handed out. Okay. Uh, members, the A32 um, addresses the finances or the amount of money, the appropriation going to our counties. Um, for the redetermination process, and this money in particular is for the income verification service um, that they use. Senator Aki, we are having a hard time coming up with that amendment. Can you switch to the next one? We'll come back to it. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's not printed yet. How about the A35? A35, thumbs up. That's a good one? Yep. Okay. Um, members, the A35 is in our A2 amendment on page It's being one handed out. Sorry. Okay. On 179. Yes. Thank you. And uh, this falls under the uh, section, the school-based health centers. 
and this is just a short amendment, but you go to uh, page 179, line 15. As you read through that amendment, um, or not the amendment, to read through that section, this thing is wide open with lots of possible interpretations, et cetera. Um, I've zeroed in on one, and that is on line 15, adding um, the part of may only be provided to a student after consultation with minor's parent or guardian services, or I guess there's services at the end, but, but it should be uh, parent or guardian. But um, and the reason being is with this school-based health center language, there is nothing there that um, requires that there be an adult in the uh, decision making. Um, whether that center is on campus or off campus, it's a relationship with the school. And I want to make sure that, uh, that there's an adult that weighs in on the child's decision. The amendment we saw earlier um, that clarified this section just said that the school would continue to have the school nurse, uh, uh, mental health professional, or whatever they all have. So we still have those maintain the, them. This is additional, but it left out a lot of things. And I'm just uh, at that point wanting to make sure we still have an adult uh, weighing in on those decisions for that student receiving or going for care. Senator Wickland. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, Senator Utke, I, um, while I um, can see what you're trying to accomplish with this um, amendment, I will oppose it. I do think that the school-based health center um, centers have procedures and uh, processes for how they are working with um, children. And I don't believe that all of that is included in this in this bill. And I would not want to add a requirement um, to be it must only prov be provided um, after consultation with a minor's parent um, because I don't know that I would agree that that should be in place for all services. So I would um, I would be opposed to the amendment. Further discussion on the A35. Senator Abler. Well, thank you. And, and Madam Chair, uh, is this a, a governor's proposal, or did this come from somebody carried it here? Met, Senator Wickland. Oh, Senator Wickland. Sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, Madam Chair, Senator Abler, it, was, it, it is a governor's proposal, which is where we um, brought it into the bill, but it was a bill also carried by a member, um, Senator Murphy. All right. Well, Madam Senator Chair, um, can I, I have... I have a lot of questions about this. This would be an appropriate time probably to add in context with this. Uh, could the department come up and uh, answer some of my questions that would relate to this amendment as well? Are there questions about the amendment? Right. And what's, it's, yeah, because I'm, I know there's some things you can do without parental consent, some things you can't do, and so I'm asking them to tell me what kind of services that would include so I can understand the amendment better. And so there must be somebody from the department who can talk about this whatever department that even was. The Department of Health, and it looks like there is someone coming forward. Did Thank you have you. a question? I do, Ryan. actually, yeah. I've, um, th this is actually an important area to discuss, and I think all my questions can be put in the context of this amendment, and then when I'm done with that, then we can yeah, go to the next thing. So. Um, so, uh, Madam Chair and to the department, I'm sorry, I don't know your name yet, but um, I'm curious, um, these, these clinics, I, I, I'm, in, I'm in the business, and there are certain things I cannot, I cannot treat anybody underage for my scope without the parental uh, permission to do anything. And so, there's a list of items in the bill uh, that it says that they can do on line 179.14, uh, and it runs to, to point two six. Can you just tell me which of those the school clinic will be able to do without parental consent? Um, good morning. My name is Kathy Wick. I'm with the Minnesota Department of Health, the Child and Family Health Division. Um, Madam Chair, Senator Abler. 
uh, with respect to school-based health center services, and you were referring to 179.14. One right. Right. That yeah, right. That um, I can't speak to exactly what each school-based health center does in terms of procuring parental consent, but the a, a school-based health center in general is allowed to provide care. Some of it they may confer with a parent. Some of it a minor consent law allows the minors to provide their own consent. Um, so this um, bill gives, um, you know, opportunity for students to receive health care in a school setting um, that includes um, a variety, as you can see, at least 11 different. All right. Senator Abler. That did not make me feel any better. I feel worse now. Um, Madam Chair, <laughs> is it Miss Wicken? Is that how you say it? Kathy Wick, yes. Wick, oh, Wick. Okay, sorry. Um, Ms. Wick, thank you, and I appreciate the discussion. Uh, I've not been briefed on this at all, so maybe it would have helped if I would. I'm just, I'm reading it over, and I don't know what you were going to pick up from the governor's bill, Senator Wick, then, so it's appreciate that you're, you know, have put it in. Um, so, for instance, on 19, 179.17, if I wanted, uh, if this person came in, came in and wanted some help with their diabetes and their asthma, uh, is that something that they would need consent from their parents to talk to you about, or would that just be something you would do for them? Ms. Wick. Senator Abler, Madam Chair. Um, as I said earlier, I can't specifically speak to how each school-based health center would handle that. I believe that many, most students who have a chronic condition, um, parents are informing the school of that. They're completing... Um, forms and protocols so that um, the school health uh, personnel are aware of those conditions and um, would likely be consulting with parents on that. On the other hand, there are other services that a school-based health center should be able, that is able to provide um, as they deem through their nursing judgment and other health care judgment. Um, okay. But I would, I would my experience um, as a registered nurse and working with schools is that many times parents are involved in these decisions. Madam Chair. Senator Abler. Maybe I'll just take it a different way. So there are certain things that are specifically excluded from parental consent. Um, and I don't know about the ages, um, but um, uh, contraception, that's available at a certain age. And I'm actually very interested in all these details, and maybe offline somebody can tell me what is specifically the current law on receiving that, uh, what the current law is on age of receiving um, uh, an abortive fashion um, based upon House File 1 passing uh, and the changes in the courts, which has just been discussed even in today's paper about the appeal is not going forward or something. Um, and. And so what laws are in place that require parental consent? It's under my, I, I understand in my practice, I must get parental consent or I'll be sanctioned by my board for not getting parental consent to treat somebody under age 18. We have a form that parents fill out and then we do that. And this is very concerning to me, the, the answer you've given me that, well, they'll just get, they'll talk to the parents maybe. Um, and in, re, in receiving counseling services, I know there's some things you don't have to get parental consent for some of that. Um, I'm interested if they want to go in there for gender affirming care. Uh, will the parents be part of that discussion or not? Um, and I know that's much the subject of much debate uh, these days. And so um, I would like to ask a specific request from the department about what indeed does not require parental consent in the opinion of the department as we guide this forward which makes this amendment maybe even more important to discuss than ever, and what things um, do and do not. And specifically, uh, abortion services, specifically uh, gender-affirming care, specifically counseling, specifically uh, diabetes and asthma care, since that's listed, um, specifically acute care for illness and injury. Uh, they 
break their leg and you don't have to call the parents. Uh, mental health, what is the just what is the current law? So we can understand this so as policymakers we will know. Uh, for vision care, I don't, can you go buy glasses at the optometrist's office without getting, um, without getting permission? <clears throat> Nutritional counseling, substance abuse, and then referrals to a specialist. So you go in for something and at school and then suddenly you're at the allergist's clinic or suddenly you're at a clinic for cancer um, and when do you have to tell the parents? And so this is a very, this is not a small item, uh, independent of diluting the school's efforts at education, which you can argue some clinics are needed to help some underserved areas where they don't have access. We talked about that earlier in the access question, access question. So um, I am, so that's my question. So just if you can, and I did, I, we have not spoken. I don't like to put you on the spot, but I'm, you can just reply that, yeah, I'll we'll work on that and get back to you if you want, Ms. Wick, and, and then I'll be uh, complete with my discussion on this section. Senator Abler. Ms. Wick. Madam Chair. Um, there's nothing about this that changes current law, and there are school-based health centers in place now, and uh, we can uh, try to answer your question. There were a lot of questions there, but... Um, We'll try to answer your question. Well, thank about, you. About consent. But this, is, this does not change anything around current law as it relates to parental consent, gender affirming care, or some of the other conditions that you mentioned. Right. And Madam Chair. Senator Abler. I just want to be reassured what current law is. So am I wasting my time getting the parents' consent to treat them um, on this sort of thing? Uh, you can't get a tattoo without parental consent. So. Um, I appreciate the discussion, and I have not come to be dilatory. I just had these questions about this, and I'm just more concerned than ever, Madam Chair. But I, Ms. Wick, thank you very much for what you're going to do. And I, I think once you get down the list, you'll see that some things do absolutely need consent, I hope. Um, so thank you, Madam Chair. I'm done. Senator Wicklin, did you have anything to add? Uh, Madam Chair, I, I was just going to re reiterate that I believe that this this legislation wouldn't would not change current law in terms of what is required um, in terms of parental consent, and that is why I would not um, support um, Senator Edke's amendment because I I don't believe that we should be putting that um, must only be provided after consultation into this bill when we have um, already have laws in place that that kind of cover um, how parental um, consent is um, governed. Senator Rucky. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Ms. Wick, for your comments there. And I, I hope that, uh, Senator Wicklin, we can, that you will continue to take a look at this as it moves forward, because I think as the uh, exchange um, between Ms. Wick and Senator Abler went back and forth. There's a lot of unanswered questions. I have a ton of unanswered questions. And the fact is, if this is all in statute in law currently, why do we have this section being all rewritten? That, to me, creates questions. And so I hope that we can continue the conversation um, going forward, uh, because we know that this will have um, a number of stops yet to go. and. Uh, uh, I thank you for having the conversation here this morning. Thanks. Thank you, Senator. Did you want to vote on the amendment, or are you withdrawing it? I guess we can see it's not going anywhere, right? <laughs> so I will withdraw it, <laughs> and uh, we'll the hope it. 35 has been withdrawn, and now we have the 832 in front of us. So if you want to go back to that one, you are welcome to. Okay. Uh, the 832, um, as I started with earlier, uh, affects our counties, and it goes back to the redetermination process, which will start up here real soon um, and run over the next 12 months, um, so that all of those on MA and Minnesota Care will reapply. Um, but there's a portion of it that is in our uh, spreadsheets, 
and that affects the Income Verification Service. And that's the tool that the counties would use to verify income um, of the applicant to make sure they qualify for their services. Um, the amount in the spreadsheet is two million a year, or no, it's a, a million a year. I've, with the amendment, have gone to two and actually read something this morning um, in the actual Senate file and House file that were pertain to this. Rather than two million, it's actually for year 24, it's two million three forty five and continues to go up a little bit. Um, but I guess first of all, I would. Uh, uh, ask uh, Senator Wickland if uh, this is something that you can can work with and if so we can adjust the numbers to actually make our counties whole on this income verification service Senator Wickland thank you madam chair Senator Atke this um, we put the you know this uh, provision in the bill but we funded it at the the level that the governor's proposal um, came forward with, which is what you you mentioned, the one million per year. Um, I have heard from the county um, county representatives that this that that is not a sufficient amount, and I would like to um, continue discussing that with you know with the counties and understanding better what is the the full amount that would be adequate to covering their costs. Um, I, I would prefer not to adopt this amendment at this time because we do have our we've met our um, our targets with the bill as it is before you today and um, but I'm happy to talk more about it as we move to the finance committee. Senator Aki. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, Senator Wickland. I think that's the best way is to uh, uh, find out exactly what that number is and then you can fill it in once rather than have to bounce them around but I wanted to you know to bring it to everybody's attention and you already know about it so I appreciate that and uh, I'll at this point then withdraw this amendment and let uh, Senator Wickland fill that in as she moves forward. A32 has been withdrawn. Did you have other amendments Senator Rocky? Yes. Um, let's take and uh, go to these two are going to go there's the A36 and the A37 go together if we could get those handed out okay they are both on their way you can proceed okay um, what this is is it addresses the suicide and crisis lifeline um, and we had had a, a, a little bit of that topic earlier on in one of the earlier amendments, um, and I had asked the question about the amount because uh, the amount filled in is four million on our current spreadsheet, and I was trying to uh, change the form of funding. Um, as I look at it, anyhow, um, this particular process is more of a mental health issue, and. So with that, I would like to not include it on our telephone bills and in turn turn it into a general fund uh, appropriation. And that's what the A37 does is it shows the, uh, uh, the appropriation changing from the four million which is plugged in so far and changing it to 13.5, but let me how I came up with that amount of money with the extra 9.5 million is the language that's currently in the A2 amendment says we would either we'd go from 12 to 25 cents um, per line per month um, and raise this money. The work that uh, the investigation and uh, the data I've been able to collect on this shows that that type of funding would result in for every penny on your phone bill would equal about $800,000 in revenue that would come in that could be uh, appropriated as it's designed here. So that means a nickel per month per line would actually equal the $4 million that's uh, proposed in the uh, original spreadsheet line. 
So it's, it's going to boil down to what does this thing really cost and uh, what will that number be. But so that number is debatable, but at this point, I would like to see it go, for, take it away from our phone bills and make it a general fund obligation appropriation because it is mental health and that's where we fund the rest of our mental health issues from. Um, so that's the two. The A37 shows the amount of money and that is um, changing, um, moving money around there and then the A36 is changing the uh, language in the bill. So with that, Madam Chair, that's what these two amendments do. Senator McLean. Um, Thank you, Madam Chair, Senator Utke. I, so I, th I think there's a couple different um, things you're raising here in terms of, you know, it, is the correct amount included in terms of how um, this service needs to be um, funded moving forward? Is it adequate or is it, you know, more than needed? Um, and then there's there's your, your point about um, using a telecom fee. Um, to do this. So I guess first to just address the telecom fee, um, I believe that the federal government has given states permission to establish this type of telecom fee for 988. And to me it does, um, I think it does align with the current way that we fund our, like our 911 service. Um, there is an access charge and a, and a fee involved that goes on every phone line. Um, I think that that ensures that the, the infrastructure is there to um, maintain and run this, this system that people are already using. Um, they already are depending on having access to this. I think it will be um, something that we um, value over the years having this 988 number for people to use to, um, to get access to help with uh, mental health questions and very strong concerns about, um, you know, suicide and other severe um, situations they might be in. Um, if I look, I was provided some information about the history of 911 fees. If there's a concern about raising the fees, um, the 911 fee has a, a cap in place and um, the statutory maximum is 95 cents, but <coughs> Since 2010, uh, when it was established to today, it has has not. It's gone up, and then it's gone back down, and it's currently um, 80 cents. So they they haven't continued to increase the fee over time to to the maximum. Um, there's another fee, the Telecommunications Access Minnesota Fund. Um, it's statutorily set as a maximum of 20 cents, but the current fee right now is is four cents. So the language we added today requires the commissioner to do the work to understand um, what amounts of money are, are taken in and how much are needed and to basically account for the costs and make sure that the fee is set at the right level. Um, so I, I would not support um, your amendment to, to change that away from a, a telecom fee. Um, as for the, the dollar amounts and whether they um, relate to supporting and sustaining the 988 lifeline, um, the governor's proposal has a lot of information about um, how they decided on the funding amounts um, and um, the proposal to provide $4 million in fiscal year 24. Um, to be used for competitive grants that are for Minnesota Lifeline Centers that are part of the 988 Suicide and Crisis Lifeline Network um, and to make sure that that we have the infrastructure in place to support this this valuable service. So I guess the bottom line is I, I don't support removing the telecom fee and I do think that the governor's proposal and my bill um, have done the work to um, kind of propose uh, an initial dollar amount that makes sense for the services that we're, we're trying to provide. Thank you, Senator. Senator Abler. Well, thank you, and I, I won't repeat what Senator Utke said, um, but I, I just want to just help us think about what we're, well, what, I'm not proposing what the 
uh, the majority is opposing, proposing in uh, many places. Um, we we're like have like literally twenty six billion dollars that's being spent in the next four years, and there's two billion of dollars in like new money rolling in from many sources, including this one. You think, oh, it's just a little fee here, a little, a little, little increase the. No fishing licenses there, a little capital gains here. Uh, I don't think anybody expects increased costs from this legislature. And I, I like the idea about taking out of the general fund. It serves everybody. Uh, the general fund is funded actually on a progressive taxation basis. Um, and that's what we've kind of agreed to, that people should chip in more. This is a regressive way. Um, and. It doesn't really follow the curious. I'm talking about progressive uh, income tax that center off, and that's for you. Um, and so, uh, but I, but I just, there has to be some way we can live within our means with what we have without generating new money. I think it's an error to even get the whole two billion more. So I'm just going to offer that thought, and I, I believe this is a, an appropriate way. We don't suggest a fee, uh, some kind of Medicaid fee or something, or you know, a nursing home fee. We are raising uh, background study fees by 5%, which are we going to get better I mean, with no money to replace that to the providers? And that's just my one mention of that in this bill. I wanted to bring that up. And after a while, none of it's free. And when you take it as an aggregate, I don't think anybody went to the doors uh, asking for their vote saying, I want to raise two more billion dollars from you. And this is all part of that. So uh, that's all I got. Thanks. Senator Aki. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I guess uh, I hope that uh, the conversation does continue um, because uh, there's some important pieces to this. Uh, I thank Senator Abler for his comments on this also. And I picked the 9.5 million because that's based on real close to that 12 cent, or which was the bottom of uh, the scale. And so I hope that there was. Uh, being it did come on the governor's budget too, that somebody actually thought about what those numbers meant and what they really needed because at this point it looks like uh, uh, quite a large sum um, that could be collected, uh, but as it moves forward, we'll see. But uh, uh, because I would like to see this move, uh, its funding source move, let's vote. Members, on the A36, all those in favor signify by saying aye. All those opposed? No. no. The I, amendment I, is not I, I, adopted. I, 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 I voted the wrong way. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> division. Yeah. Yeah. I know what the result is. Oh, Send it to the floor. On the A37. I, I'm just used to sitting in this chair. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed? No. no. The amendment is not adopted. Thank you. Oh. Senator Utke. Okay, after that one, we got to get focused again. Um, let's uh, do the A33. Members, the A33 is not in your packet, it is being handed out. Go ahead and proceed, Senator. Members, uh, when you get the A33, this uh, amendment is going to uh, fall under the heading um, that starts on page 154. Um, it's under the requirements for certain health care entity transactions. Um, we've heard a lot about this over the session. We had an evening session on it too with a couple of the uh, hospital entities looking at um, a merger. But anyhow, as I go through that, the one part that uh, was bothersome to me was all of the additional language that empowered the Attorney General's office beyond what they currently have in law. Um, they currently are fully involved in the process. Um, they represent the state, etc. But this added a lot more th items to their, their list of duties um, and including, you know, the transaction has to, a lot of it, timelines through the Attorney General's office. So with the A33 amendment and what it does, it deletes all of that additional language that empowers the Attorney General and uh, just leaves it as is uh, with what's in process. Um, our statutes have worked well for many, many years 
and uh, I would like to see them remain that way. Senator Wigland. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Utke, I, um, I believe that um, we do need some additional um, powers for the Attorney General, and I would not support removing um, all of this language. Um, I am still continuing to work with the, the stakeholders because um, they did have um, some strong concerns about some of the areas that are included in this bill, and I will continue to work on that language. I will point out that I did um, incorporate some of the changes that they uh, recommended in terms of the, the timelines and um, the threshold levels for um, transactions that will be examined. Um, and so I would like to continue to have those discussions rather than removing all of that language um, at this time and, and really maybe get at um, if you feel that there are specific things that are um, that shouldn't be added to Attorney General responsibilities that we get to be more targeted about that. So. Further discussion on the A33. Senator Abler. Well, thank you. And uh, actually, I just appreciate uh, Senator Utke's generosity. I would have just taken the whole section out. Um, I don't know what problem. Senator Wickland and I have a high regard for you. And I know uh, this was actually not your work. I think it was brought by the Attorney General, and you kind of like part of it. And, that's fine, but I, I think as we, we, we talked in earlier about bureaucracy and how things are clunking up our system, I don't know what problem this is fixing. And I think it may actually affect some of our ability to attract uh, uh, special, specialists and clinicians to come to Minnesota um, and where people want to house their operations in Minnesota or house their operations outside of Minnesota. Um, with the, uh, we talked about taxes and treatment of Minnesota, or by Minnesota various businesses. There was an article in just today's paper about um, with some of the proposed changes that would go forward already on the uh, capital gains and so on, that it would save a decent sized business money to move to uh, South Dakota and then sell from there. You would much, it, it's worth millions on a modest transaction of I think 50 million or something, which is not modest to me, but um, but some of the levels you're talking about here, and I just want to caution everybody, the Attorney General, who I have a lot of regard for, at least in many ways, um, I don't always agree on everything, but I respect his position and I respect what he's trying to do, and I'm nervous about some of these big business deals, but I you just don't want to do any harm, and I'm afraid that this is still moving in a direction. So whether if it's the Senator Aki's fix or continuing to work to make sure that you're lasering in on the issues that we care about. This may have been provoked by the Sanford Fairview matter, which, you know, my feelings about that. Um, and they've delayed now their merger to a 90-day notice, which I think is healthy, allowing more time for that. So maybe this has already accomplished its mission about getting that to be more transparent and more engagement. So just, I appreciate you, I'm taking your word that you're going to keep working on this. Uh, I have a feeling that the amendment may not pass, but it's, it might, Senator Aki, so, um, but thank you. Any closing words? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, uh, you know, as I look at that, I just think it's, it's overreach for the Attorney General and in particular that office. And, um, of course, we've got the current uh, merger uh, taking place now, and we had a hearing here, so we've got um, our current Attorney General, which would seem to be the target of this um, amendment. But I think the amendment is just in general, because just going forward, I think that there's too much power um, given to the Attorney General's office, or additional things that they, uh, you know, they already do a lot of it, and, and would be there to represent the state at every level. I just don't think that we needed to do this. But uh, Senator Wicklin, you said you would continue to work on this. Um, that's what I think you mentioned. And so um, with that, then I will uh, um, hopefully we can interact a little bit on that and take you at your word that hopefully it gets better as it moves forward. And so I would, would withdraw it then at this point. So thank you. Thank A33 you. is withdrawn. Senator Rucky. Okay. Um, I have a, a topic that you would expect me to bring up. And uh, I will again, and, and that happens to deal with uh, the, the keeping nurses at bedside. And 
it's something that I've worked on a lot over the last um, couple years, and because this is in our bill here now currently, there, I've done more work and research on it. Um, and one of the particular uh, research pieces I used, uh, similar to our mandate review here with our Department of Commerce, this one took place in Massachusetts, and it talked about the mandate uh, nurse to patient staffing ratios. Um, and they did a really nice job of putting this thing together, uh, included information from California. It's uh, stuff from everywhere, people who have lived it, worked it, and uh, I think you know, we don't need to recreate the wheel. Hopefully we can learn from it. And some of their data, and Massachusetts was an interesting example because they're just slightly larger than us. I believe a 6.6 .6 million or something. So about a million population more than Minnesota. Um, that research showed that if these ratios were enacted, um, it would require almost 2,300 up to 3,100 additional nurses and staff just to make the ratios work whether they were um, actually working or not. Um, and the impact uh, from their findings was 700, or 676 million to 949 million. Now that's not a cost to the state, but that's a cost to the system. Um, we as consumers of health care would be paying more money because they're, they're the facilities are having to cover more costs. Our insurance companies are no doubt going to be caught, uh, hit with higher rates. And so this whole thing, I think, needs a whole lot more discussion and work on it. Um, I don't believe we need to move for, forward and fail first and then figure out how to uh, do something here. Um, we know that the contracts that the uh, organized uh, labor side of the nurses have, they, they work on those things and have uh, reached agreements with their employers through their, their contracts. There's others that are doing it, you know, working with their management inside of, uh, you know, their facilities. And uh, so I just think this is ill-advised at this point. So with that, I would offer the A34 amendment. Members A34, members being passed out. <clears throat> what the A34 does is delete all of the language uh, relating to the staffing ratios, etc., in that section, other than. Um, it retains the loan forgiveness part in there to help uh, for the um, recruit uh, for new nurses and help pay the, the expenses there. And I think we just need to keep something in mind. Uh, of course, I mean, nurses are important everywhere, whether it's the clinics, the hospitals, our nursing homes. We, we highly appreciate all of their work and efforts. But it's the organizational chart of health care is no different than the organizational care of other entities other than, of course, nurses are dealing with human beings, and we, that's ultimately extremely important. But whether it's the teachers in the school system, the auto mechanics in a car shop, we have an organizational chart that goes all the way up to management, and we have administrations, and we have the same thing in health care. And we just need to keep all of that in place and uh, make sure that they work as efficiently as possible. And I just see this as something that uh, is not keeping that efficiency in place. Uh, we're all very concerned about the safety of those working in health care. I know there's parts of that in this uh, uh, language. Um, we maybe can talk about, I think it all came out with these uh, uh, deletions, but um, we are concerned about that. But to make it clean and neat at this point, I left in the uh, um, loan forgiveness, but everything else is removed with this uh, amendment. So with that. Senator Wicklund. Thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Utke, um, I appreciate that we have, um, you know, a difference of opinion about um, how, how things are 
working today for nurses um, working in hospitals, and I appreciate that you you brought forward the the data from Massachusetts. But I I, I feel like that our particular system in Minnesota, you know, may be different. Um, I think the the approach that they were taking in Massachusetts, if it's if it was a staffing ratio, um, that is not what is in this bill. Um, so I, I think that we would have to have um, more information for about specifically about Minnesota to be able to compare the two. Um, and in general, I just I am opposed to removing all of these sections. Um, I believe that the nurses have um, serious concerns about um, the working conditions that are in place today, and I um, respect their ability to bring forward suggestions um, in ways that we should be improving um, improving the way um, they are working in their hospital situations, and I respect their um, ability to bring us forward some uh, particular solutions and ideas to address the, these concerns. Um, so I would be opposed to removing um, these sections at this time, and I would be um, also uh, remiss in saying that we have continued to have discussions with the, the bill's author, um, Senator Murphy, and with um, the nursing, uh, with the MNA, and with many others um, talking about uh, the language that uh, was in the original bill that has changed um, over time, over the progression through committees, and there were um, amendments made to the language as it was incorporated into the delete everything. And so I think we are um, continuing to see discussion about um, how to make sure that this language is workable and um, something that can be implemented. And so um, I would oppose the amendment. Further discussion? Senator Abler. Well, thanks, and I won't repeat what anybody said, but uh, Senator Wicklin actually expressed my views, and I don't agree with my, my good colleague on this one. Um, and it's not because of Massachusetts or anything, but uh, this has been an ongoing discussion that I'm hoping could be resolved. What made me the most disappointed was when there was a study about this that we finally passed as a compromise, then the very target of the study, which was the hospitals, refused to participate. Like, what? And nurses shouldn't go to work to get hurt. They shouldn't go to work to be serving inadequate care to people who think they're in a hospital being served by people who are able to do their jobs. And, and uh, we heard in the different hearing on, on this bill that I think Austin and some other places actually have very functional committees that work. And so uh, I don't know the, I haven't followed the exact wording of the language, but I, there's got to be a working model where this can be made to work. And I encourage the hospital association to, um, and they mean well, I, but there's these executive types that are different than the rank and file nurses and the people you see at the door um, to get, like, engage in discussions in a meaningful way. Um, and that's part of my interest in being a co-author on this project because we actually want it to work. We don't want to ruin some small rural hospital. We don't want to make it more difficult for the big hospitals in the metro to serve people that need them. But it has to work. And if it's, I do believe that many nurses are leaving because of this. And why would you do this? Uh, you know, go get a job at a nursing home at worst pay, but at least you won't get hurt there. Um, so, I, so I. Um, that's what I just my thoughts. So, and I, I really hope this can be made to be a, a win for uh, all the parties. Thank you. Senator. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, I didn't even bring up the nurse licensure compact, which would be a, a way to help some of this out. But anyhow, um, with that, uh, <laughs> um, it's. Uh, We've had a good discussion on it. Now I even forgot what I was going to bring up. But anyhow, um, yeah. <laughs> but um, I will take and withdraw it because I know what the vote will be. Uh, I just hope that we can continue to do something on this. I know that part of that it did get tightened up a little bit in one of the earlier amendments. And I hope that that will continue because, um, as I explained earlier, the organizational charts of lots of different art things. We. we we just have to make sure we do this, that they're done in the right way. And uh, uh, so on that, Madam Chair, I will withdraw. 
834 has been withdrawn. And I have reached the end of my amend Very amendments. Uh, other amendments, members? Senator Morrison. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like to offer the A38 on behalf A38 of Senator Muhammad. A38 being passed out. Go ahead. Uh, Madam Chair, the A38 um, adds um, overdose prevention grants um, to the Steve Rumler Hope Network um, and the Kajuj nonprofit uh, for outreach uh, into the East African and Somali communities, um, providing uh, outreach, education, training, and distribution of naloxone kits. So this is part of the effort at uh, overdose prevention. Senator Wickland. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, I have been in discussion with um, Senator Muhammad. I know this is a, a priority for her, and uh, we started having the discussions fairly late in the session or late in our process getting to this point today. Um, I'm willing to, to accept this amendment and have to work on how we will fit it into the budget, but I do think it's a... Um, a program that could help um, could help, and certainly um, overdose edu education and naloxone kits are um, something that we really need to be focused on with um, the large numbers of Minnesotans who are suffering from um, substance use disorder and um, are, are dying because of, of overdoses. So I would accept the amendment. Discussion on the A38. Seeing none, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? The amendment is adopted. Madam Chair. Go ahead. Uh, Madam Chair, I'd like to offer the A27. A27 is not in your packets, will be handed out. Go ahead. Madam Chair, members, uh, the A27 amendment addresses the issue of infertility, which one in eight Minnesota families struggle with. It requires insurers in the large group fully insured market to cover infertility and fertility preservation benefits. I'm offering this on behalf of Senator May Quaid, um, who carried the bill. Um, there were concerns about including these provisions in the omnibus but because of cost, but narrowing this amendment, um, the narrowing this amendment does to just include large groups um, so that there's no cost under the defrayal prov provisions of the ACA. I think it's an important first step to ensure that all Minnesotans have access to infertility care. Senator Wickland. Uh, Madam Chair, I hear from many constituents about the importance of having access to infertility treatment and how um, this is, uh, you know, maybe not a, f a fair system where we do not um, do not allow people to access um, coverage in an affordable way. And so I'm willing to accept this amendment. Um, I do, as we've had discussions about mandates, um, I have concerns about how we are not including all, and I think there's more work that should be done about include, or, you know, about the fact that we aren't including um, everyone in this coverage, but I think it's a first step, and I would accept the amendment at this time. For a discussion on the A27, Senator Rocky. Thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Morrison, who who is all who would all be covered by this? Uh, I mean, I, and by that I mean what type of plans? Senator, uh, Madam Chair, and Senator Udke, um, this would include the large groups. Um, the state health plan currently covers infertility treatments for state employees, as does Blue Cross United. Health partners. Um, this is this is imperfect, um, and as Senator Mann has suggested many times, there's probably a better way to do this. <laughs> um, but in in the interest of starting to cover the people who aren't covered um, to the degree that we're able to, given the um, constraints of cost, that's what this amendment would do. Senator Arke. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and you said CGIP covers it. Some large groups do. Is that what I heard? And then some of our health plans are already covering it? Senator Morrison. Uh, Senator Mann, Senator Arcade, that's correct. Senator Arcade. Okay. Um, and that's 
what I understood also. Um, so I was wondering, basically, what are we accomplishing with this? If some are already doing it, um, and in particular large groups get to make that decision, C gets covering it, the plans, a number of the plans are covering it. Um, to me, it's probably a mandate we don't need. Senator Morrison. Uh, Madam Chair and Senator Adke, um, uh, perhaps council can help, but it's my understanding that this amendment would cover um, almost 680,000 Minnesotans. It does not cover people who are on MA or Minnesota care to my chagrin. <laughs> council? Madam Chair, members of the committee, um, while some large group health plans do currently cover it, this would uh, expand that to those that don't, that also provide maternity benefits to Minnesota residents. In addition, I would point out other provisions of this bill um, that provide certain limitations on the coverage that don't currently exist in statute. Um, for example, uh, cost sharing requirements, including co-pays, deductibles, and co-insurance must not be greater than cost sharing requirements for maternity coverage under the enrollee's health plan. So in addition to potentially expanding the coverage, it does provide other you know, prohibitions and limitations on the coverage as well. Senator Aki. Thank you, Madam Chair. And could you repeat the number you said that uh, potential that's not currently being served or have this coverage? Senator Morrison. Uh, Madam Chair, Senator Aki, it's my understanding that it's 680,000 Minnesotans. And I'll add that there are 16 states that have IVF mandates, um, including Arkansas, Utah, New Hampshire, Illinois. Senator Aki. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, again, I think it's a mandate. It, the groups and those of us that purchase, uh, those that go out on the open market and purchase, you, you would, could shop your plan by your needs. So I, I would like this not to be something that's adopted because I think that's personal choice if, as far as if, uh, you know, if this is, if there are things that you want that coverage for, you shop that insurance plan. Um, if not, you can purchase something else. I, I think that choice is still important in the marketplace, and uh, this is just a mandate that, uh, of course, paints them all with the same broad brush. So um, I would hope that uh, we don't do that. But anyhow, I, thank you. Thank you, Senator. And a reminder that most people get health insurance through work. They cannot shop for their health insurance coverage. They are given what they are given. Senator Abler. In that case, all, <laughs> all those in favor of the A27 signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, no. no. The uh, amendment is adopted. Madam Chair. Oh, okay. Uh, Senator Morrison, do you have anything else? Madam Chair, I do not. Very good. Senator Abler. You know, I admit it when I'm wrong. Um, I thought I was done with my amendments, and I looked at the packet of remaining one, and I thought, well, that's a pretty good one. Oh, wait, that's mine. Um, anyway, I'd like to move to A16. Members, A16 is in your packet. Go ahead, Senator. And so this is a, and we brought it up at a hearing, and I wish I could have talked to Senator Wickland about this. Um, this is, um, like, we have all these FTE requests, and like, well, how many did you hire? How many did you really need? Did you need 1.6, or did you just need 1.2? And... And I, this is, a, I think, kind of at least a good start toward getting the answer to this. And if the departments are going to tell me they're going to charge money to me to tell them how they spent the money we gave them, uh, that'll be a discussion I'd like to have at some almost a shrill tone. Um, but so, uh, Senator Wick, I don't know if you looked at this yet. Uh, I, I think it's friendly to what we want to try to do, and I hope you can accept it. Senator. Um, Madam Chair, Senator Abler, uh, I, I haven't had a, a great deal of time to, to look it over. Um, I mean, I think it gets at something that you and I are, are both interested in, in, in terms of understanding, um, you know, not only are our um, grant programs effective, are the way we're spending money, is it effective? And I, I would like to get uh, more information on that, and we actually we included 
um, some language in the, the bill which actually requests that the agency work with, um, work with MMB and, and developing ways to make sure that we are funding programs that are effective or evidence-based. Um, we also have um, put language in that kind of tightens up some of the evaluation language that, so we can get feedback on, on program effectiveness or grant program effectiveness. I think one thing I would ask you to consider in terms of, you know, before we move forward with this, could we have a discussion about how some of our current um, fiscal, um, you know, analysis uh, work kind of contributes, maybe contributes to the way that, that um, you know, requests are made for FTEs. And if we could talk about like our, our LBO process for fiscal notes, where maybe there isn't um, a good method for uh, the agencies to propose um, something other than an FTE or one FTE or, or point two FE, FTE or something like that. Um, and could we assess whether the way we do this work is contributing to um, our inability to necessarily understand, you know, how the funds are um, being spent and how effective they are. So I, I, I understand what you're trying to get at. In a way, I haven't had, like I said, a yeah. great deal of time to review it, but I'd also like to see it be more um, comprehensive and, and look at how we do our planning work and is that kind of contributing to um, to how the the departments are funding or requesting funding for these grant programs. Right. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and this is a great conversation. And speaking of funds, you know, um, I think this fits in quite nicely with the fact that when we have underspending funds, right, the, the department is kept at a, at a lull because they can't purchase or be able to go into a uh, a separate flexible account to be able to access. So for example, in 245D, uh, Madam Chair and Senator Wicklund, the statute right now says if you're gonna do a license, it's got a 60 days. But we have people that four months to 18 months, and do you know why that is? It's because of an FTE problem at the Department of Human Services. There's the amount of work that's required and the amount of staff, that, that line has stayed flat, but yet the amount of, of responsibilities for that. I like where this is going. Um, matter of fact, I'd even like it more if we could put a provision in there that says if you're not gonna spend the money that you're supposed to be spending before it goes to the general fund, it should go back to the Department of Human Services. I'm just saying there's a theme in this piece, right? Since you're gonna talk about funds and fiscal notes, why don't you two come up with a, an option that says that money was that's earmarked for our most vulnerable in the state of Minnesota, of which, in order to get their job done, they have FTEs to do it. So um, I'd like to see this actually get some kind of priority, and I thank you for bringing this amendment. So thank you. And by the way, Senator Wicklund, thank you for saying funds and fiscal. So I wanted to get my plug in there. Okay. Senator Abler. Well, thank you. Uh, Senator Wicklund, do you want to take this as a placeholder? Do you want me to work on it, bring it to the floor? Um, the, the idea is we just really want to know how good did they hit the target, and I'm comfortable either way, and I don't want to push you to take something you're not ready to take, but I, you know my intent. Uh, Madam, Madam Chair, Senator Abler, uh, I'm trying to debate whether I would accept it, and I, I do think that you know it could have um, initially some fiscal impact because of you know how they respond yeah. to how this work, but. On the other hand, um, you know, maybe it would be good to incorporate right now, and then we can have right. more discussions about it. So, I would right. accept it for now. All those in favor of the A16, signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? The amendment is adopted. Madam Chair. Senator Abler. I was looking at another leftover amendment. I thought, I wonder what that one does. Um, <laughs> and uh, that's mine too. The A7. I'll move A17. Um, and uh, like, oh yeah. Um, anyway, so this uh, Anoka County is going to do a, a training uh, for uh, a, a pilot for doing training for for the SNAP program, 
And I believe this is technical advice from the department. Uh, and so if staff can confirm that, but I th think that's what it is, so. Um, Senator Wigland. Um, Madam, Madam Chair, Senator Blair, if I guess if Ms. Huffman has any comments on it, I think it is a technical amendment and yeah. what we received guidance from the department on this. Uh, Madam Chair, Senator Wickland and Senator Abler, you are correct. It was technical assistance from the department. It's a good amendment, Madam Chair. Any further discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? The A17 is adopted. Senator Abler? Uh, I have a couple of questions, but I don't have any more amendments. So. All right, well, let's finish up our amendments first. Um, I, uh, Senator Bolden. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would move the A31 amendment. The A31 is not in your packets. Do we have it ready? And we have it ready to go. So go ahead, Senator Bolden. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Members, this is an amendment related to uh, my bill around um, charity care and hospitals providing information to patients um, who may qualify for charity care. We have, uh, since the bill was heard in committee, we've continued conversations with stakeholders, um, including the Hospital Association and um, collection, the Credit and Collections Association, the Attorney General's Office, um, and others. And this is some uh, compromise language, if you will, that came from those discussions. Uh, I'm happy to elaborate if members have other questions. Senator Wigland. Uh, Madam Chair, I I would accept this amendment. I think that the the provisions that Senator Bolden brought forward that um, will help clarify and strengthen um, patient access to um, the different charity care and and um, yeah options at ho when they are in the hospital setting. Um, I believe that she's been working on this, and and I would accept the amendment. Further discussion on the A31? Seeing none. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? A31 is adopted. Senator Bolden. Thank you, brother. Um, so I have the A13 in your packets. This is a facility fee disclosure amendment. Um, it adds telehealth services to the notification requirement of hospital facility fee charges. Um, what we're hearing is patients are getting charged for a facility fee when they're doing telehealth and they're not being told about this. So this just adds that and clarifies that language that they should be told about this fee. I think so. Um, Senator Wickland. Uh, Madam Chair, um, Senator, uh, I have been in discussions with you and with um, the Senate Senator who brought this to us, uh, Senator May Quaid, and um, it does seem like an issue that we should be addressing. Um, I think being providing notice that this um, fee might be charged, it seems like a good first step to make sure people understand uh, when the facility fee is going to be charged. So I would accept the amendment. Further discussion on the A13? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? The A13 is adopted. We will proceed with the A39, which is not in your packets, and is ready to go. So the A39 does some changes to the um, Keeping Nurses at the Bedside Act. It removes some lines from 118.15 to 118.18. Also, um, 118.23 to 24, removing language that requires uh, nursing staffing to be posted in patients' rooms. Um, we heard that, or we discussed that uh, involving patients um, in essentially hospital politics is not the most appropriate thing to do. Uh, patients should be focusing on their recovery, not what's happening in the hospital. We also took, um, we made changes to 122.9 to 122.17 to clarify the language of when nurses can um, decline patients. There was also some language changed on line 122.25, inserting may and striking shall. Um, this was a DLI recommendation for compliance. 
And then um, on lines 121.6 <clears throat> to 121.20, the adding consideration of inpatient psychiatric unit to that language, this was a recommendation from NAMI. <clears throat> Excuse me. All of this language was discussed with the bill author and with uh, the stakeholders, Madam Chair. Um, Senator Wickland. Sen um, Madam Chair, I, 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 my understanding is as well that you are working or have been working closely with the author and discussing these amendments and that the, the language that came from the Department of Labor and Industry is something that, sh that they have been working with the author, bill author on. And so I would see this as um, an acceptable amendment to add and, and I hope that the discussions continue, close discussions with our members and with um, Senator Murphy. Further discussion on the A39. Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, the A39 is adopted. And lastly, I have the A29, which is not in your packet and is being passed out right now. The A29 clarifies language for the pregnancy companion piece of the bill. Um, we had changed some of the language to make sure that the environment was safe for patients. Um, and in changing that language, it was brought to our attention that, that it was too broad. And so we reined in that language to make sure that uh, we specified exactly what we meant when uh, someone is not allowed to be with that patient. Specifically, uh, generally in an operating room or if the support person is being violent or threatening towards staff or other people in the hospital. Senator Wickland. Uh, Madam Chair, I think that if, if you've worked on this language with the stakeholders and they are in agreement that by adding this we are clarifying and um, not, you know, changing, altering drastically the, the purpose of, the, of this provision, I think it, I would accept it and, um, and I'm assuming that you, you've done that work, so. Yes, thank you, Senator. We did. We've uh, spoken to the uh, stakeholders, the advocates, as well as the Minnesota Hospital Association. Thank you. Further discussion on the 829? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? The 829 is adopted. Members, are there any other amendments? Seeing none, um, discussion on the A2 as amended. Senator Abler. Well, thanks. I just have a couple of questions. And um, just... Um, and so first, uh, Senator Morrison, uh, the contraception language and 77.26, is that the same as the bill that we discussed before with all those caveats about Catholic hospitals and all that? That's the same language that we, you had before. Senator Morrison. Uh, Madam Chair, Senator Abler, can you direct me to where? Oh, page 77. The, the, that whole contraception uh, <laughs> mandate stuff is in there. That's the same. I just want to know just... You just say yes, that's the same as what it was before it just got dumped into here. I think that was Madam your bill. Chair, was Senator um, Abler, I don't think that is Senator Morrison's oh, provision. I think that's um, Senate File 287. That's Senator Murphy's bill. Oh, I'm yeah. sorry. Well, they all asked. Senator Wickner, is that the what? same one? Just dropped in identical. Yes. Okay. Um, uh, Madam Chair, Senator Abler, yes, Perfect. it's from that um, bill. Senator Abler. And then I, I don't know if you can answer this question. Sorry, Senator Morrison, I just forgot whose author it was. Uh, so thanks, Madam Chair and Senator Wickland. Um, on line page 291.10, there's a bunch of changes to the, the there's a whole new section about uh, disqualifications and it's redone somehow or other. Um, does somebody know, there was a task force and we kind of passed the task force about cleaning up some of who can do what and disqualifications. Is this reflective of that? And I, I don't know why we're redoing the whole section, but do you know that, Senator Wickland, or is that the department question? Uh, Senator? Uh, Madam know? Chair, I believe it's related to the background studies area, and I don't know if, um, Ms. hoffman Lucci, if you could be more specific, and if we need the department to comment, I don't. Um, do Senator Abel, Madam Chair, Senator Abler, could you repeat the question, please? Oh, I, well, actually, I'm, I'm curious why we're redoing all that. But also, there was a task force that came up with some recommendations that passed to the floor, maybe. 
um, or is sitting, it went through judiciary and it was really good work to make sure we're not disqualifying people who should not be disqualified. Is this section reflective of that work? Um, from Madam Chair, Senator Abler, from my understanding, the task force um, recommendations were what we have passed out of this committee. Um, and I'm not sure, I'm sure the department could speak better to that, but I'm sh a lot of the background study provisions currently in the DE, um, well, the bill now, um, reflect just changes to conform with federal law. Um, and other statutory changes to 245C. But I'm not sure if they came out of the task force specifically. All right. So, Madam Chair, my request is having done that work and having been trying to fix this since 2005 when all of it changed, in some cases wrongly, um, would it make sense to make sure we update this somewhere along the way to have the, a list that we've agreed on already? Senator Wicklin? Madam Chair, Senator Abler, yes, we can, um, we can make sure that we're, yeah. because we did hear those two bills in our committee, um, one of them, Senate File 1164, was passed out and I believe went to judiciary and then went to the floor. We thought that they were um, not having, or not carrying any cost. Um, but we've learned that that's not the case, so we will have to be re-examining how, how we take that in, in and, and reconsidering how we do that, right. because it is a high priority to, um, to make that, um, to pass that bill this year. So Thanks. I, I guess I'm just saying that we will be talking about this topic and trying to figure out how to, how to make that work with the budget. Oh, well, thank you. And, Senator Abler. And budget-wise or not, it just makes little sense to, I mean, I just hope we can preserve that work even since this bill is suddenly full of all that same topic. So I'll leave it at that. Uh, Madam Chair, I just have two more questions. Senator Abler. Um, and a comment to the department. On line 360.19, DHS is setting up some cultural grants, um, which are, you know, fine. They're nice grants. Um, but as we... Uh, the, the Department of Health has set up a whole array of, I'll just call them cultural grants, grants for targeting certain populations. And it just seems like we really want to make a point to make sure that these are kind of coordinated and dovetailed so there's not just a DHS program and the MDH program and, and then nonprofits doing things. And it's, that's our comment. And I can, you know, just as it moves forward, I think I, I plan to do a fair amount of work, uh, seeing if there's a way we can't make this actually accomplish the end. And, in coupling with the access discussion uh, that we had. And so that's just a comment. And then finally, um, uh, on the, I have a question about the funding and maybe Mr. Albrecht can comment or uh, for later, I chatted with the um, MMB folks uh, beforehand. Um, I'm requesting um, that somebody can comment to me on the status of the general fund in 28 and 29 uh, and also the healthcare access fund in 28 and 29. I made that request to MMB, uh, if even only penciled in. Uh, I am very concerned that we've taken a billion and a half dollars out of the healthcare access fund well, in the first place. I think that's an error that should be retained, if nothing else, as a, as a fail safe account uh, for if things fall apart. But instead, we put money, we, well, we, it was, whatever, the bill has um, put a billion and a half dollars in uh, as a one-time funding source, and we're supporting many ongoing costs. And it's impossible for me to calculate what the impact on the details in 28 and 29 is going to be, but I think that's something we very much need to be aware of. Uh, if the money was put in, in four little aliquots uh, across the four years, then at least it's kind of a little lower number in the final biennium. Uh, but it's kind of skewed to the end, and so I'm worried about that. And it's so, um, I don't know if Mr. Albrecht wants to comment, and I'm sure Senator Wickton, you do not want to put us into a guaranteed deficit in 28 either. So, Mr. Can Mr. Albrecht? Albrecht, comment on that. Um, Madam Chair and Senator Abler, um, I will be happy to uh, work with the folks at MMB to work out an answer. It's often a challenge to 
to try to determine the precise effects that far in. Um, but a fair question certainly is what is the structural balance in the healthcare access fund in fiscal year 2027? And I think that's something with just a little bit of time we could determine. Well, thanks. Senator Amber. And I'm, I'm just about done, Madam Chair, but I, I appreciate the freedom we've had. I, I think the committee's been run nicely to let us have the dialogues and as the vice chair and the chair just to comment about that. So, so thank you to those two individuals. Um, but so I'm, I'm happy with an imprecise answer Mr. Albrecht and to the chair and to the MMB. Um, I am a little concerned that as I ask this question, it seems like a novel question. Um, and it is not a novel concern. Um, we have just, we, we were, <laughs> when I was, I've attempted this uh, effort where you put a large cost item in the fourth year of the biennium and only have to pay for one year of it, which has a huge impact on the out by any uh, past the four-year horizon, particularly if some of those are increased, and we used to call those asterisks. Um, and so I think that will inform some decision-making, and I'm afraid that in this bill and the aggregate bills uh, in the Senate, we are overspending the projected revenue in 28, and that's what I'm trying to get at, uh, and they could be taken, and certainly there, there's a target that's been given to this group that's going to affect the ongoing revenue uh, or expenses. So that's all, and I, I appreciate it. And Senator Wicklin, I just want to finally offer my thanks to you for your open uh, attitude toward working on this. Um, this bill is a long ways to go. I, I, have a, I can't question your motives, but I kind of know where you're trying to go with some of the things you're trying to accomplish, and we share many of those, and I'm happy to be a part of a positive effort at that. So thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Further discussion or questions? Senator Rucky. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Senator Wickland, I've got a couple questions. Um, first one is on page 67, um, and that's under the NCPDP real-time prescription benefit standard. Um, just wondering if you know, um, I've got people that have said that they cannot comply, and I did do some research on there. It references the uh, Medicare Part D, and particularly the Section 1860 D-4 of the Social Security Act. And I went through that, and everything I can find, I find nothing related to the real-time definition. Um, and maybe this is even a, uh, probably a question at some point for the department. Is there a definition for this real-time, and how would somebody comply? Because I'm hearing that it's not possible or it isn't out there yet. Mm -hmm. Madam, Madam Chair, um, Senator Utke, I don't have a specific answer I can give you. I can certainly find out more. This is language that was um, brought forward by, by Senator Mann in um, Senate File 328 and I think has to do with um, some of our transparency efforts. Um, and so I would have to go back and do a little more research on, on, that, on that specific question. Yeah, from my understanding, it's... It's not necessarily new language that's already been introduced in the past, but the system just hasn't been brought forth yet. And so that's why people can't comply as of yet, because the system's not ready. Right. I went online and you research all the federal stuff and correct, it's not there and people are just asking questions. So it's good to know that that's, if we've got it coming up in a bill that possibly will pass, uh, we're going to have to have answers for them. But anyhow, with that, Madam Chair, I would like to go to my second question, which is on page 82, and it falls under the prescription drug benefit, transparency and management. Um, and Senator Wicklund, my question there is, if we go back to the original bill, um, and in particular the Senate file was 328, but that had quite a large fiscal note, um, almost $50 million in, Current or the current biennium and uh, over 71 in the tails, but yet when I look at what's in the spreadsheet, it's very minimal. Um, two different locations of two million the first biennium, um, and uh, not even a half a million um, in the tails. Do you know offhand what was taken out of that bill? What would have changed the uh, uh, 
fiscal note that drastically? Uh, Madam Chair, Senator um, Aki, again, this is from Senate File 328, which is Senator Mann's bill. My notes about this are that we, uh, when we were putting together, um, and maybe Mr. Albert can comment on this particular line item, but I believe that we used a fiscal note that um, to prepare it, and, and that's where we took the, the information and the numbers. And I don't know if you want to comment any further depth on that. Mr. Albrecht. Um, Madam Chair and Senator Wickland, I did not have all of those notes with me. Okay. I would have to double check um, all of that and so get back to we, you. We can look, we, um, Senator Man, or Chair, Madam Chair, Senator Edgar, we can look for that detail if you'd like the details okay. on that. All right, thank you. Um, I've got one last uh, question, um, then you can see by the clock we're running close to our uh, uh, floor time. But um, this one, um, Senator Wickland, is on page 145, um, line 11. And this is a section about fees and such for the hospitals and providers. We get to that section now, which uh, Commissioner may charge hospitals an annual fee, and uh, it's got a per bed bassinet fee. Then it gets deposited into a special special revenue fund, um, cited or credited towards trauma hospital designations. What what are we anticipating, or what what is this for? Because I mean, I can see it's for going to the trauma hospitals, but uh, we already collect other fees. Um, trying to figure out what the purpose is. Senator Wicklund. Madam Chair, Senator Utke, I'm. Um, not finding on my, or I can look on the spreadsheet. This is a uh, governor's proposal that was brought forward, and um, and now I have lost track of the exact use. There is a governor's change page that describes the reason and the need for the fee, um, and maybe Mr. Albert can find it on the spreadsheet. I'd... Mr. Albert. Madam Chair, Senator Wicklin and Senator Utke, um, it is on the, the governor's proposal and what's in um, Senate File 2995 is the proposal on 91434 of the spreadsheet. Um, it does relate to uh, the trauma system fee. It is a fee increase. And it also is a proposal that moves money around within the state treasury related to the, the, the trauma system fee. And so that, I haven't seen the language, but that, that may be, it's a combination of things that are going on in the proposal. Lines 1439 and 1430, or 40 rather, show the amount of new uh, revenue that is created under the proposal. Typically, um, fee revenue is put into, as it is in this case, the state government special revenue fund and used to administer um, the regulations that relate, regulatory activities, I should say, that relate to the purpose of the fee. Senator uh, Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Mr. Albrecht. Um, yeah, that you know, I could see what that there was fees, but I was we're going after the you know the hospitals are paying an additional fee. I mean, they're already getting fees in another portion of this, so it's an it's an added fee, a new fee that the hospitals would be paying. Correct, um, Madam Chair uh, and <clears throat> Senator Winklin, I think it's a change to an existing fee. Okay. Mm -hmm. Just Madam moving Chair, it. That's my understanding. Moving and reappropriating. Madam Chair, Senator Wickland, and Senator Utke, um, I think it is a fee increase, to but to an ex it's not a new fee. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Um, any final comments, Senator Wickland? Oh well, thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, and I'll just keep my comments very brief um, because we do need to get to the floor. I really appreciate all the discussion today, and um, 
people um, who brought forward amendments. I really appreciate the ability to dis discuss those and hear your thoughts about the bill. Um, I am, um, but I want to spend most of my my brief time. I just want to thank um, the staff and. Uh, members so much for the work that's gone into getting to this point today um, Especially would like to thank all of those who have made the committee meetings run um, uh, As Senator Abler um, Mentioned I appreciate your mentioning it to um, our pages Andrew George and Sam Sch Schachman um, have been dedicated to um, getting everything moving um, in terms of our committee time here over the session, which um, has been a very intense um, intense period. And we've had lots of uh, paperwork and papers to distribute, and I really appreciate all of their efforts. Um, also want to thank our, our council and fiscal staff, um, Lexi Stengel, Alyssa hoffman Litchie, Liam Monahan, and Noel, um, Nolan um, Hadala. Um, it's been an incredible effort over the past um, week or two, just getting all of this um, massive bill put together and the language, and I appreciate all of the countless hours that, um, that you've put into it, along with um, Mr. Albrecht in the, f the fiscal um, work. I could not... Um, I can't imagine all of the, the different tasks that you've been doing, and I appreciate your guidance and help in getting all of this put together. Um, also, our researchers, we have Larissa Fisher and um, Emily Spateri, <clears throat> excuse me, from uh, Republican Caucus and the uh, DFL Caucus. Um, they've provided invaluable uh, background information to us and um, have it's it's really an import very important part of our committee time <clears throat> and then certainly my staff um, Anna Burke and, and Haley Ryan um, I couldn't have gotten excuse me I apologize it, it's a lot a lot to get to today and I just want to express my appreciation to everyone for, for all the work. So um, it's not the end. Obviously, we're, we're at one point in time, and the bill will change um, immediately leaving this room. Um, but um, we will be working. <laughs> and sad, sad to. Um, and I, I think that's just the nature of um, all of the hundreds of pages that are in it. So. We know that there's things that will will have to change, and um, we will discuss some of those in finance and some on the floor. Um, but I appreciate everybody's time, and um, I think we've come up with a a, a good bill. And I'd like to move that um, Senate File 2995, as amended, be recommended to pass and be sent to finance. Thank you, Senator, and we, uh, we thank you for your dedication and hours upon hours of work uh, to this bill. Um, we will uh, move Senate File 2995 as amended, be recommended to pass and be re-referred to the Committee on Finance, and that staff be instructed to make necessary technical and conforming changes. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? No. The motion prevails, and the bill is re-referred. Thank you, Senator. And we are adjourned.